Okay, so we'll start. Uh, I think most of the people here know uh, Christophe because uh, he's been at IAP since 2004. So, but okay, so let me uh, just remind quickly. So, Christophe, you have done your PhD in Cambridge with Donald Linden Bell in '94, and then a postdoc at CETA and in and then in Bale. And, uh, and you've been hired as a CNRS uh, researcher in Strasbourg, and then you moved to IAP in 2004. So uh, just you, your main topics of research are large-scale structures and, uh, and cosmic web uh, uh, geometry, and, uh, and also galaxy dynamics, which you studied during your PhD, and uh, we'll talk about this today. Um, so hello. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I'm happy to uh, ha be given the opportunity to speak to this colloquium, since it's the first time I speak at EAP since 1998. <laughs> where it was uh, in the current uh, forum, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe I've forgotten, I tend to forget things. So, uh, uh, so I would like to present some uh, fairly recent development in collision-less dynamics carried out first by Jean Everts, uh, who trained a few astronomers in the room, uh, and more recently by uh, my uh, former student Jean-Baptiste Fouvry, uh, Pierre-Henri Chavani, uh, John Magorian, uh, James Binney, and Simon Prunet from IAP. And I would like to stress that this is worked inspired by uh, the published work of uh, Martin Weinberg. So the key preconception is that gravity is the dominant force everywhere, almost everywhere in the universe. And our aim is to understand the long-term evolution of self-gravitating system leading to processes such as radial migration or disk thickening and barrier crossing near supermassive black holes. I will rely on a novel equation in the field, the so-called Balesco-Lenar equation, and I aim to show that this equation provides a stochastic framework in which can complement or indeed rival uh, the classical n-body framework. It opens the possibility of following semi-analytically uh, the complex dynamics of self-gravitating system over a Hubble time. Uh, this is, uh, as far as I know, unprecedented for cold or tepid systems such as galactic disks. Um, and so I, I will go from the general to the particular and from galactic dynamics in the broad sense to stellar dynamics in nuclear cluster at the end of my talk. I hope to convince you that these so-called uh, kinetic theories uh, can address key questions in galactic and nuclear long-term dynamics. So the origin of this equation arises from a transposition of Brownian motion in the context of gravitating system. Uh, so since the work of Einstein and Perrin, we understand how uh, ink diffuses in water. This process reflects a very general principle in physics known as the fluctuation dissipation theorem, which relates the rate of diffusion of something to the correlation of the fluctuating force uh, responsible for the diffusion process. The key idea is that typically uh, hydrodynamic and um, radiative process locked by symmetry self-gravitating system into state of low entropy where stars follow unlikely quasi-circular trajectories imposed by the main field. So I will transpose this uh, dissipation fluctuation theorem in the context of, of self-gravitating system and I will show that through resonances a star can start to feel each other and eventually distort their own orbits. This corresponds to diffusion in orbital space. So it's the distortion in orbital space which um, uh, makes the, p the position of a given uh, orbit <coughs> diffuse, and this is the analog of the uh, ink in, um, in water. This is what we call secular evolution, the slow process by which self-gravitating system evolve towards more likely states through the fluctuation of the gravitational potential. Uh, so as promised, I will start with galaxies in general, so as to let her draw your attention to the specifics of galactic centers, since in some sense the general problem of uh, the secular evolution of a galactic disk is uh, simpler than the particular evolution of the galactic center. So I will explain how this object will evolve on cosmological time scale uh, through the self-interaction of its component. Technically, and I'll come back to this, we, we want to understand radial migration and disk thickening as a process in order to understand uh, its origin. Uh, this is uh, um, what's known as galactic archaeology or near-field cosmology. We want to time reverse the evolution of such an object by studying its, its uh, long-term evolution. Indeed, a key property of a thin galactic disk such as NGC 891 uh, is that its formation process has set it up into a dynamically improbable low-entropy state of quasi-circular stellar orbits. Uh, 
through shocks and radiation, it's, uh, and, the, and the, the origin of this uh, unlikely state is because it, the stars were born uh, uh, from, the, from the gas, which, which through shock and uh, radiation has set up the stars into quasi-circular orbits. So given a Hubble time, it can and it will indeed uh, easily readjust its orbital structure via resonant encounters so as to explore more likely configurations. So the, the, the purpose of this talk is, can we explain this slow evolution, spontaneous evolution of the system for, from first principle? So uh, our own Milky Way is observationally a special case of interest since we can study it in much more detail than external galaxies. Uh, as most of you will know, it is being monitored as we speak by the Gaia probe, which will release in a couple of months uh, 1.3 billion proper motions of stars in the extended vicinity of the Sun. So this will both most likely be a game changer for our understanding of secular evolution in galactic disks because the Milky Way is the galaxy we can study in most details. For instance, Gaia should be able to rewind galactic history using metallicity encoded in stars so as to understand the effect of secular processes on galaxy evolution. So this is um, nature in the so-called nature versus nurture conundrum of galactic evolution. This requires us understanding radial migration via blurring and churning. Uh, for those of you who don't know the word churning in English, it's uh, roulement or um, uh, qu'on fait tourner du beurre, barraté. Uh, but what it means basically that, as shown on this simulation done by Anaël Allé, that the, the, the position of a given star at some final time compared to the position of its initial time varies as a function of cosmic time. So this is, uh, this is the churning, the fact that a star which is born at some radius will move away from where it's been born through secular processes and res resonant encounters. Globular clusters represent another class of stellar clusters which are hotter, as in higher velocity dispersion, and so less responsive, but which contain fewer stars, hence are more sensitive to short noise effects, such as described by the present formalism. Uh, their circular ev evolution is, is the subject of our ongoing work, so in this talk I will focus on what's already published and I will focus on galactic disks, but uh, there are another example. So the abstraction behind my presentation is to consider sorry, the following system. Um, I have a thin disk embedded in a dark halo and possibly a bulge and a thick disk. And um, while this level of description is crude, uh, the motion of stars within such a system uh, remains relatively intricate. This is something that we'll need to address in order to understand uh, and predict the long-term behavior of this system. So can we predict what the self-interaction of these stars will do to its orbital structure? And the key ingredient will be to identify recurrences uh, which allow the perturbation to build up through resonances. So this is uh, what I'm going to be repeating uh, over and over in this talk. And the motivation, again, is to explain radial migration and disk thickening. Uh, I'll then, at the end of my talk, focus on galactic centers. Uh, while the motion of the so-called S cluster at the center of the Milky Way is Keplerian to first order, we, we may wonder what the effect of relativistic correction from the massive central black hole may do on long time scales, and what would be the importance of the mass of the stars in the cluster. This is all the more important on those scales because the orbital time scale is very short on, and on the, other hand, the, the, on the other hand, the Keplerian potential is special. Um, so the, we need to be, a, to, to be able to account for the fact that we're dealing with a Keplerian potential. And the, the, the physical context is to understand the diet of the black hole. It needs to eat a certain amount of stuff but not too much because uh, we know for instance that the current black hole uh, in the galactic center is being quiescent. So one could naively think that this problem can be tackled straightforwardly using n-body integration, but it turns out to be re remarkably difficult to integrate many relativistic trajectories over secular time scales, which is why it's of interest to develop uh, complementary kinetic theories. A key astrophysical which can be addressed while modeling nuclear clusters in orbiting a supermassive black holes are the following. There's the so-called last parsec problem, which I just mentioned, to understand why supermassive black holes don't eat too much nor too little, to remain consistent with what is observed. Uh, this is a fine-tuning problem, which people in the field have been trying to address for a while. The galactic center is also the archetype of an AGN in its quiescent phase, and given the importance of AGN in regulating galaxy formation and studying this quiescent phase uh, is of interest. Uh, 
It can be used to test general relativity, quantify the supermassive black hole spin, or estimate the expected rates of tidal disruption events when a star is being uh, depleted of its atmosphere because it gets too close to the galactic center. And this uh, has a and if you have also less massive black hole orbiting, uh, then you can uh, address the question of uh, what's known as EMRI, uh, which is, forgot again, uh, um, extreme mass ratio in spiral. So when a, bl a small black hole is going to uh, sink towards the more massive black hole and potentially emit gravitational waves. So this, this type of formalism should allow you to predict the expected rate of such processes induced by the self-gravitating self interaction of the nuclear cluster. Beyond the galactic center, there's the archetype of our external galaxy, our neighbor M31, presents a double nucleus which is expected to correspond to an eccentric disk orbiting a supermassive black hole. So understanding why an eccentric nuclear cluster can survive long enough to be observed is also a secular question which we are currently investigating. And since astronomers like to classify things, they, they tend to think that uh, uh, nuclear clusters are divided in two, the Milky Way and Andromeda. So this is the other case of interest. Um, so for the sake of this presentation, I'll, I'll restrict myself to single nucleus. But uh, uh, I wanted to give you a broad picture of why what I'm going to present to you is, is of uh, interest in various contexts. OK, so for the purpose of this talk, the abstraction will be formally the CERM. The same, I will have a, a flattened stellar cluster playing the role of a disk, and the bulge is replaced by uh, the central black hole. Uh, this will, uh, the potential is, is different because um, uh, it's dominated by the central black hole, so we have a Keplerian potential. Uh, this is a complication because it induces de degeneracies in the frequency. The radial and the azimuthal frequencies of a Kepler potential are identical. Um, we will have to circumvent these difficulties uh, which are specific to nuclear clusters. And once again, the objective is to control its diet. Uh, I'll say a few words about the more general situation uh, when the surrounding cluster may be triaxial or, or when the supermassive black hole might be spinning, uh, uh, depending on the environmental effects, uh, which will induce possibly a, a precession of the um, uh, and a spin-up of the, uh, the central black hole. Um, but this is slightly more complicated because of a lesser symmetry. So let me recap. We want to understand secular evolution, the slow process by which, uh, through fluctuation, self-gravitating system evolved towards more likely states. So my presentation will be divided in three parts. First, I will motivate why secular evolution is relevant and discuss the key features of the process uh, one must focus on when describing the long-term evolution of collision-less system. So this will, be, this will be the core of my talk. That I will present to you the corresponding master equation and how to solve it. And just for the, for the pleasure of uh, Patrick, I've added a few slides about how you derive the equation, but I'll just probably flip them to you. And finally, I'll, I will illustrate the impl its implementation on three physical problems. First, the problem of radial migration and thickening as a proof of concept, which quantitative comparison with n-body simulations. And finally, I'll focus on what I pretended I would do in this talk, which is the secular evolution of quasi-Keplerian cluster, um, which, as you will see, is a special degenerate case of the general formalism. So, in this talk, I'm concerned with understanding how a stable self-gravitating disk or cluster responds on long time scale to the fluctuating environment of its own grave, gra or its own graininess. Uh, the fact that it's made of a finite number of stars or a finite number of, globular, of giant molecular clouds, etc. Et so one question we may ask is, how can galaxy move along the Hubble sequence um, through its self-interaction? And uh, can we understand the uh, secular evolution of, the, of galaxies along the Hubble diagram? Uh, we're here in, in the context of trying to disentangle nature versus nurture, uh, to distinguish in the long run how uh, the environment is impacting a, a galaxy and what is triggered by its self-interaction via finite N effects and departure from the mean field approximation. So in this talk, I will focus on nature, but keep in mind that a small variation of the present formalism can also capture uh, uh, nurture, i.e. the effect of the environment. Um, 
So the, the physical motivation, astrophysical motivation, is to understand galactic chemodynamics and the secular evolution of galactic centers. Uh, so our task in this talk is to implement a quasi-linear theory which describes the long-term evolution of uh, collisionless or stellar systems. So uh, focusing on, on um, first on cold galactic disk, uh, I, ha I will describe them uh, through, uh, uh, I will have to describe through five main characteristics of this disk which are of relevance in order to write down the equation. So galactic disks are inhomogeneous, that induces complex trajectories. Uh, their trajectories are multiperiodic with short dy dynamical time scales, which means that the, these systems are typically phase mixed. They are self-gravitating and cold, meaning low velocity dispersion, uh, which means any perturbation uh, will be strongly amplified. Uh, they're possibly embedded in a live cosmic environment, so they can be perturbed from the external environment, and they're made of a finite number of particles, so they're discrete. <coughs> so this is the typical intricate trajectories uh, that I've already shown to you of uh, stars within uh, the galaxy imposed by the mean field. So in order to uh, make sense of what's happening to the, these orbits and how do they distort as a function of cosmic time, uh, we need to, uh, to rely on a statistical representation of the distribution function of uh, these stars. So we are going to transform the uh, long-term evolution, uh, the question of the long-term evolution of this system as an equation for the evolution of this distribution function, which we'll have to qualify uh, and quantify on short time scales, on dynamical time scales, and on secular time scales. So in order to... Uh, uh, in order to do this, uh, I will um, um, rely on, so on canonical variables which are known as ang angle, uh, angle action coordinates to simplify the, the previous trajectories. And let me uh, illustrate to you what they are using uh, the, the example of a pendulum. So if we consider a 1D pendulum, we can, um, we can uh, position uh, the instantaneous state of the pendulum looking in phase space, where this is the angle and that's its momentum. Uh, and we can label uh, uh, the coordinate in phase space using the circle corresponding to the uh, 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 swiped area by the trajectory in phase space. So the, uh, the radius of the um, circle can be used as a canonical coordinate, and that's the action. And then the angle is just the phase of the, uh, the position of the pendulum on that circle. So if I move from, uh, uh, from the original uh, canonical coordinates to these angle action coordinates, then what you see is that uh, the Y label is just the size of the circle and the X label is just a coordinate which varies linearly with time. So the, the trajectories in this, new, uh, in this new way of mapping phase space is purely ballistic. Things just swipe from the left to the right uh, at fixed action. So this is nice because we're back to uh, describing the system as though it was uniform, even though it has a more complex trajectory in configuration space. And one other very important and nice property is that the frequencies of the system, which are important for recurrence, as we will see, are just simply the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to these actions. So the, the, once again, uh, the actions are preserved and, uh, and the angles just vary linearly with time in these new coordinates. So that's a bit boring in, uh, in 1D, but something a lot more interesting happens when you consider the slightly more complex toy model of a 2D pendulum. So say you, you plug two, a rope between two points here and then a second rope in the middle like this. And you ask yourself, what is the phase space trajectory of uh, this two degree of freedom pendulum? Uh, a linearized pendulum. Uh, so it's just the, uh, the uh, direct product of two pendulums. So the, the phase space trajectory are going to lie on a two torus. And uh, so it's, it's, it's also boring in some sense. But something really interesting happens uh, regarding the frequencies. Uh, depending on what the relative length of these two ropes are, something interesting can happen. Either the two frequencies are commensurate, which means that the trajectory in uh, phase space is going to uh, uh, span a region of zero measure. Commensurate means there's, an there's a double integer so that you can nullify the dot product of this double integer with the two frequencies of the system. So there's a resonant happening. Uh, uh, every time uh, one degree of freedom uh, oscillates n times, the other degrees of uh, freedom oscillates p time. Uh, or the two frequencies are not commensurate and then uh, 
the, uh, the trajectory of phase space of our pendulous is going to, uh, to fill the torus. Why is this of relevance to galactic dynamics? For the following reason, if there's no resonance, then the, the likelihood of the blue particle meeting the red particle uh, as it swipes its uh, angle space is going to be low. It happens quite rarely because the trajectories are all over the place. Whereas if I have a resonance and the two particles happen to resonate with each other, they're going to meet each other very often. And so this is key in, uh, in driving the system into a new state because it will allow to interact more often and in the context of galaxies, exchange angular momentum and, re and reshape its orbital structure. Uh, I uh, suggest you go and see this beautiful e uh, uh, experiment of uh, 2D pendulum done with sand on the web. Uh, and so, once again, uh, the, the, the existence of resonance within the system drives recurrence, and recurrence allows for secular evolution. So, we're back to our nice orbits. Let's uh, intricate orbits. We move to, um, uh, to angle action space. This is the same trajectory seen in phase space, in Vz versus Z and Vr versus R. And you see that uh, in, in the phase space, if you use these actions as labels, so the action is formally just a swiped area of each degree of freedom, then the trajectories are much simpler in that uh, uh, action, spa action angle space. And so uh, the, the question of the evolution of the distribution function, uh, if you wait long enough so that uh, the trajectories are phased of rage, is only a question of how is the uh, orbital uh, structure going to change and how is the underlying distribution function going to evolve as a function of cosmic time because these actions are going to uh, uh, be distorted so, uh, and, and diffuse in action space. And so the, the question we now need to address quantitatively is how does the distribution function diffuse via the fluctuation of the, 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 flu the force field? And so as I've already suggested, it's going to happen through resonant interaction which is going to be self-amplified by the self-gravity of the system. Okay, second point, I'm going to go a bit faster because they're more uh, trivial points or more familiar to, uh, uh, to most astronomers. Galaxies are relaxed, so initially uh, in a few dynamical time through, through the fluctuation of the mean potential, uh, they, which we, what we call violent relaxation, the, the mean potential becomes time independent and the, dis the, the system uh, relaxes into a state which is only characterized by its... Uh, uh, actions and uh, given a, a few dynamical time uh, galaxies are also phase mixed which means that a given uh, perturbation in angle action space will be swiped away and will only depend after a short amount of time only on the actions through the fact that different orbits have different uh, specific frequencies so that you have this uh, shearing in phase space which means you lose track of uh, what the exact angle of a given star is. So. Um, the only, uh, once the galaxy is locked into this regime, it can uh, no longer exchange angular momentum except through the fluctuation of the uh, potential, whether it's being externally induced or internally induced by the discreteness of the system. And this is what secular evolution is supposed to capture. And um, to repeat myself, uh, the, the, the distortion of the orbits, the fact that these actions are going to involve on long time scale is going to be driven by the resonances. Galaxies are self-gravitating. If I consider a leading uh, spiral wave of small amplitude as been shown by Tumri in 81, uh, through the process of differential rotation and, and, and self-gravity, it will unwind and in the process of unwinding, so it's leading here and it's trailing after this point, it will be strongly amplified. And uh, one thing to keep in mind uh, as a raw number is if you have a disk with constant rotation curve, which is a good model for the Milky Way, the amplification can be a factor of 100, which means if you put a mass of mass 1 in your favorite unit into a, a, a disk with a flat rotation curve like the Milky Way, then the particles, uh, the other stars around it, will be deflected uh, because you've added this particle and will create a polarization cloud, uh, uh, what, uh, what plasma physicists uh, call the susceptibility, which will be a hundred times more massive than whatever you put. So this is very important because we will see that when we look at uh, secular diffusion, 
This susceptibility that I've just mentioned is going to be squared. So here you have a factor of, of 100. When you square it, you will have a factor of 10,000. So the fact that self-gravitating cold disks are, um, are very susceptible uh, has a tremendous impact on the efficiency of secular evolution, uh, even though you would think, OK, uh, a galaxy contains many uh, giant molecular cloud. Why do I care about shot noise? You do because every shot noise is being dressed by a factor of 10,000. Okay, galaxy are self-gravitating. How do we deal with this? Uh, just a small amount of um, beautiful mathematics. Uh, we need to take into account that an external or assumed external perturbation is going to be uh, inducing a deflection of the trajectory through the linearized Boltzmann's equation. Uh, uh, which will ch induce a uh, change in the underlying distribution function. Uh, uh, if you project into a position space you, by integration over velocity, it will correspond to a, a perturbed uh, over density, which itself induces a perturbed uh, uh, potential fluctuation, which you need to add to the external perturbation. So you need to, to deal with this uh, feedback looping of uh, self-gravity onto the system. And since 96, uh, since 76, uh, we know how to deal with it. Basically, we make the equation, uh, the Poisson equation, disappear from the problem by projecting the response of the system into a, a basis, uh, a biorthogonal basis function, which automatically satisfies the field equation. So basically, uh, um, the, the self gravity problem disappears. And the price we have to pay is instead of having to deal directly with the uh, perturbation in density, we need to, to, build, to deal with the time-dependent, self-amplified uh, 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 evolution of the, the coefficient of this expansion. So this is an example of such radial basis of uh, potential density pairs. So just uh, this is in mathematics what I just told you in word. You project the external potential onto the basis. You project the self-response onto the basis. And you get uh, um, an implicit equation for the evolution of the, the, the response. And uh, if you go to Fourier space to deal with the convolution, uh, you find that uh, the response, what you're interested in, uh, involves, uh, is proportional to the external perturbation through some amplification, uh, for some, tr some transfer function, uh, which is called the response matrix, and uh, uh, which has this nasty shape. Uh, so it involves an integral over action space. We're considering all the orbits. Uh, we're looking, at, we're weighted by the, the gradient of the distribution function, and it involves uh, as a denominator uh, resonant frequencies. So again, a resonance bites you in the linear response of the system. What this means is that uh, if this matrix has uh, one as an eigenvalue, you have a division by zero here, which uh, physically means that um, the system would be naturally unstable. It would grow exponentially a spiral wave, as we saw earlier. So we're not interested in this um, exponential growth uh, when we deal with secular evolution. But um, we are interested in a regime where m has eigenvalues close to one, which is another a mathematical way of saying what I was telling you earlier physically, which is that disks are uh, self-gravitating and, uh, and strongly amplify spiral perturbation. Um, so again, remember that this gravitational susceptibility encoded in this matrix is actually squared for a secular evolution. Galaxies are perturbed, so uh, this is a simulation that Jean-Baptiste did of uh, uh, the uh, external part of a dark halo. And so, uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, we can uh, modify the formalism to account for the external perturbation instead of self-induced. And so the game of uh, understanding the long-term evolution of uh, galaxies is to weight the relative importance of self-induced versus external perturbation. So here I will focus on internal perturbation, which falls into the realm of the ballet school equation. And they're made of a finite number of particles. I've already made that point. OK, so let, let's be, uh, move away from the math and be very concrete. Let's consider a numerical experiment. Where I, I set up a disk which is uh, designed to be stable in the eigenvalue sense that I've described earlier. It doesn't uh, have a one as an eigenvalue, so we know it should, it should uh, just sit there forever, right? So you, you take a mestel disk with a surface density uh, like this, so constant uh, velocity uh, potential, uh, and you let it go with half a billion particles for many, many dynamical time scales. This is the, the, the same disk as seen in action space, which is where things matter, as I told you. 
So you have a lot of uh, quasi-circular orbits. This is a measure of the eccentricity of the orbit, and this is, a, this is exactly the angular momentum of the orbits. So you see most of the orbits are on uh, circular orbits uh, in the vicinity of the maximum of the surface density. If you carry this experiment, normally nothing should happen uh, in the limit of an infinite number of particles. Because you only have half a billion particles, what you see after a little while is that the disk is going to generate a ridge in action space. There's a depletion of orbits which were originally here, and these orbits have moved into more eccentric and different angular momentum. This is churning and blurring in action. Uh, it's telling you that uh, the eccentricity of the orbits have increased, the system has heated, uh, it's the blurring, and they've moved to different angular momentum, this is churning. So you see that on this completely idealized experiment, no dirty physics, no metals, no whatever, you can still uh, see that gravity by itself, even though the system is, uh, uh, should be linearly stable, is uh, allowing it to evolve. If you look at configuration space, which is done here, you do see that absolutely nothing happens. This is going on for a, a Hubble time or more, and you see, whoops, you see that the, the spiral waves are appearing and disappearing, but uh, nothing is happening to the disk. Uh, and s whereas if you go to uh, orbital space, which is what I've been arguing you should do, you find that after a while, this is a time sequence, you find these ridges appearing. So this is a... a animation of this. Every time it, it, uh, the movie swaps, it's a Hubble time, so I don't know how to slow this uh, <laughs> animation, but uh, this is uh, hundreds of Hubble times. Uh, and so, uh, you, th so this is an experiment where you see the process of s the, the finite number of stars driving the system into a new configuration where the, its orbits have been distorted because it's been allowed to exchange angular momentum through resonances. Uh, why is this an N effect, a finite N effect? This is shown in the amplitude of the perturbation if you do modal analysis of your disk and you find that depending on the number of particles you put in your simulation uh, in a ratio which is uh, proportional to the number of particles, nothing happens uh, for a certain amount of time. So the fact that the uh, response of the system depends on the number of particles is telling you that it has something to do with the finite number of particles. Okay, so this is a synopsis of uh, what we're after. We start from initial conditions, uh, cosmological simulation. Through violent relaxation and phase mixing, uh, we reach a crazy stationary state, uh, which can uh, self-amplify uh, perturbation through the self-gravity of the system. Uh, the, this perturbation can be uh, external and can be described through the Foucault-Planck equation, or dressed Foucault-Planck equation, or internal dressed, uh, described through the balis coulenard equation. And on secular time scale, many dynamical time scale, it can drive the system into a new distorted equilibria, or it can drive the system, as we will see, into a new configuration which happens to be unstable, and then the system will say, oh, I can redistribute my angular momentum even more efficiently. So this is telling you how unlikely it is to be a disk for a galaxy. And the reason it's been uh, put into this crazy position of being a disk is because it was born out of gas, and the gas shocks and can only happily stay on non-intersecting non orbits. Uh, so uh, gravitational system will uh, evolve if given the option uh, unless they're locked into these um, strange uh, configuration by birth. That would be the case of a disk. But even an NFW halo uh, is set up into a configuration which is not the isothermal sphere because it's, it, it, uh, it's a... Qua uh, it's, um, metastable state in which the system gets locked into and it can't exchange angular momentum anymore. But if you let uh, an NFW uh, system with few enough particles, it will uh, redistribute its angular momentum and move towards the maximum entropy uh, solution, which would be the isothermal sphere. Or at the end of the day, a, a, a massive black hole and all stars being uh, thrown everywhere. Uh, and so what drives this secular evolution is the resonant effects um, which are amplified by self-gravity through uh, uh, and uh, inducing orbital distortion. Okay, so let me move to uh, the, the equation and how to solve it and then present the illustration. I hope uh, um, up to now you've been following me. <laughs> uh, um, 
So we want to describe uh, through the effect of a uh, finite number of uh, components, uh, systems which are inhomogeneous, stable, self-gravitating, isolated and discrete. There's some literature on the subject. Uh, it, was very, it was developed in uh, plasma physics for uniform medium by Balescu and Lenard, as its name imply. Uh, it was uh, described for the first time in, uh, in um, gravitational uh, regime uh, by Martin Weinberg, who made a who assumed the cubic uh, uniform medium, uh, so the, the direct analog of the plasma case, and it was formalized for, uh, for, for galactic disks in the spheres by uh, Evert in 2010, and then we started working uh, on, uh, on this. Uh, I should mention that uh, René Pollard, who's an important uh, person in this institute, also published a paper in uh, two, uh, 1987 uh, giving a formal solution for a stellar system, but not explicit. Um, okay, so this is the equation. Uh, I know in colloquia we're not supposed to show many equations, but uh, since the whole talk is about solving this equation, I thought I should show it to you. So it's a diffusion equation uh, because it involves the divergence of a flux. So this is a divergence and that's a flux. So it's like a heat diffusion equation, except it's not heat which is diffusing, it's the properties of the orbits of a galaxy. Uh, it grows like, it scales like one over n. If you, put, if you go in the mean field limit of having an infinite number of particles, then, uh, then this is zero and nothing happens. The orbital structure is frozen. Uh, it involves a sum over resonances. Uh, the, these are the, uh, the um, uh, quantum numbers describing the, the possible resonances that I mentioned when I dealt with my two pendulum. Uh, and it, it assumes that uh, the, uh, the two involved uh, distribution function, uh, the, the distribution function is squared here because you need a coincidence. And these uh, two uh, representation of the system should satisfy a resonant condition. This is what this Dirac uh, delta is, is telling you here. They, uh, the, the two orbits should have matching uh, frequencies. Uh, should have frequencies which resonate with each other. There should be, uh, the, the, the delta function should be contributing something to this integral over all possible orbits. And uh, most importantly, and that's the tricky part numerically, uh, it's being amplified by the susceptibility of the disk to self-gravity. So this is the factor of 10,000 that I was telling you about, which encodes the, 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 the determinant of the matrix response that I've mentioned earlier. So uh, these are the main ingredients, and uh, I, should, I, sh I can't strongly enough em emphasize that this is the master equation describing dynamical friction because it captures the usual dynamical friction à la chandra sécart that you're familiar with, but it also captures the fact that when you heat, when uh, dynamical friction occurs, the system which is responsible for the friction will heat up. And this equation captures both processes at the same time. You can take the limit of this equation, uh, modulo uh, uniform medium, uh, uh, infinite system, etc., and you, it boils down to uh, Chandra Sekar's formula. So, this is a generalization, uh, the, the correct equation to describe dynamical friction. And dynamical friction is very important in astrophysics. I think everybody would agree. So, this is an important equation. <laughs> Uh, so this is just for uh, the pleasure of Patrick. Uh, just the idea behind the derivation, you write uh, phase space conservation in 6nd dimensional uh, phase space, uh, which is, and you get the, the classical UV equation, which tells you that uh, phase space density is being conserved. You take moments of it, which you always do when you do BBJKY hierarchy, and you get uh, always f uh, expression of the form uh, the nth point function uh, is sourced by an nth plus one term function. And then you, you become a less uh, courageous and you truncate at uh, order two, uh, so that you're only dealing with the one point function and the two point function. And if you neglect the one point function, you get the usual Vlasov equation that uh, Stefan has mentioned a couple of uh, months ago. And if you go to next order, you're a bit more brave and you truncate at order one over n, n being the number of particles in your system. Uh, then you get a, an equation, uh, evolution equation for the two-point function, um, which through this truncation, uh, it happens you can solve. Uh, and you need to just rely on the fact that the two-point function uh, is going to evolve much faster than the one-point function, which makes sense because the two-point function uh, describes coincidence within the system, and these coincidences don't last very long, right? So it's, it's uh, called the Bogoliubov synchronization hypothesis. 
And when you do that, then you're in business and uh, the, the equation has sufficient symmetry that you can write it as I wrote earlier. So that was for Patrick. <laughs> uh, now, uh, uh, let me describe you in uh, physical terms uh, uh, the, the process of resonant encounters. Uh, so uh, I mentioned to you we have this uh, delta function uh, corresponding to uh, the, co the, the requirement that uh, the frequencies of the stars should match. So if I consider a, a blue and a red star and uh, allow them to rotate, and then I'm going to move into a rotating frame in, in which these orbits happen to close. So this is uh, what's happening here. So now I move to the rotating frame and I move back. So you see that when I'm not in the rotating frame, uh, the two orbits seem to describe a, a figure which is uh, axisymmetric, so no torque can be exchanged. But it so happens that these uh, two orbits are resonating in the same frame. There exists an omega in which m1 omega 1 is equal to omega and m2 omega 2 is equal to omega. So m1 omega 1 minus m2 omega 2 is zero. Okay, this is what this, uh, this rotating, uh, moving to the rotating frame is telling you. So in that rotating frame, uh, these two orbits uh, can uh, uh, exchange angular momentum because they feel each other as not being axisymmetrically distributed. And this will allow them to, uh, to distort, to ex because they've exchanged angular momentum, they've changed their action, so they've distorted. And so this is uh, why um, the, it's only through resonance that uh, the, the uh, secular evolution can occur. And an important point to notice is th these stars don't have to be close to each other. They don't have to meet physically. They just have to resonate, which means that uh, they do something within the system so that they, um, they meet each other at some distance regularly because of these coincidences induced by their natural frequencies. So this is again the same idea, no exchange of angular momentum if they're, if they're not co-rotating, uh, if they're not resonant, if they are resonant they can exchange angular momentum. So resonances drive recurrence, recurrence allows for exchange of angular momentum and so resonance drives secular evolution. So let's now, and this is the most important slide in my presentation, uh, think about uh, what's happening for a system which has fluctuations. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, um, so here we're looking at uh, uh, phase space again. So you remember we had a disk with a distribution function and I've only represented fluctuations uh, within that space induced by the fact that I have a finite number of stars. So this, this is just a ro uh, realization of a random field which is supposed to represent the fluctuation of my orbits induced by the finite number of stars. If it so happens that I have an extrema of fluctuation here in the blue region, which is a, of a line of constant omega, which is the same as a line of constant omega for another resonance, which has also an excess of uh, fluctuation, these two excess of fluctuation will talk to each other and they will exchange angular momentum. And this is what is driving uh, the, uh, w which is why the fluctuation in the system is allowing the system to exchange angular momentum beyond the mean field limit. If there's, no, if there's an infinite number of stars, there's no fluctuation, nothing is happening. Because I have a finite number of stars, the fact that you have an excess of stars at some point somewhere in the galaxy which can feel an excess of other stars somewhere else in the galaxy will allow these two excesses of, charge, of stars to exchange angular momentum and that is what is driving the secular evolution. So you could say, okay, who cares? I mean, there are many stars in the galaxy. Uh, this is like a fluctuation, it's boring. But remember that these fluctuations are amplified by a factor of, of 10,000. And remember that, say, in the galactic center, we don't have billions of stars. We have a f uh, hundreds or thousands of stars. In the solar system, we would have a few number of uh, objects as well. And in the galaxy, we have a large number of stars, but we have a much smaller number of giant molecular clouds. And if you write the equation for the coupled systems of stars and globular and GMCs, you will find that it's the GMCs which drive the dense. And so, uh, the, 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 uh, hence the relevance of having a finite number of uh, giant molecular stars. Okay, so now I need to um, go to astrophysics and, uh, and wrap up soon. Uh, so this is the equation again. Uh, uh, it has this dressed uh, susceptibility coefficient that I haven't described earlier, which is here. 
which you can write as this. This is our basis function, which is chosen once and for all, and this is the response matrix, the thing which is, cl which is uh, close to one and which is going to blow up. So um, uh, when we want to implement this equation, we have a few difficulties to, to address. We need to go from position space to angle action, and that's not a given because angle actions are a bit tricky in practice. We need to deal with the self gravity, so to uh, use basis, uh, the basis element and, and, and compute these matrices. Uh, and we need to deal with the resonant encounters, so we have an integral to do over Dirac's. So uh, it's doable and it's been done by Jean Baptiste during his PhD, but it's, it's tricky because you need to, to keep in mind that this is a double integral over phase space. You have a first integral over phase space here. Uh, through this integral over action and over the, uh, the conjugate variables to the phase. But you also have the matrix hidden in here, which is also an integral over phase space. And that's expected because you're looking at gravitational coupling, so it's the coupling of this with this. You need to integrate twice over phase space. So there's no free lunch, but it's still doable. And so the way you deal with it is you... Uh, you restrict yourself, say, to thin disk for which uh, the ang ang angle action can be r written explicitly. You use global basis element. You use a numerical linear theory to compute the matrix response. That's the most time-consuming part of the calculation. And you, you deal with the delta function by integrating over resonant line. And uh, that I've already said most of this and uh, whatever. So there's some technicalities involved in, in computing this diffusion uh, coefficient, but it's doable. So let me illustrate to you uh, how, how it can be implemented in three cases, and I'll finish my talk there soon. Uh, so let's first consider the razor thin disk of Selwood's experiment. And um, again, the motivation is uh, blurring and churning and uh, galactic archaeology. Uh, so this is, uh, we want to look, to solve for this uh, flux this is the, the equation rewritten formally, uh, and we see that uh, one of the characteristics of the equation is to sum over all resonances. And uh, what you can see is that the, the ridge is indeed dominated by one resonance, which is the inner and blood resonance, the uh, two radial oscillation for one azimuthal oscillation, the ellipse case. Uh, so uh, we, we compute the flux for the various resonance, and we do indeed find that we are dominated by the uh, the flux along the inner limb blood resonance. This is the result of the uh, experiment done by Selwood. Here he's represented the excess and the depletion of orbits. So the orbits which were originally here have moved along the ridge. And this is the result of the implementation of Jean Baptiste uh, using the ballet school equation. So it's in qualitative argument. Um, and we find that indeed there's a depletion of orbits um, uh, at small eccentricity and uh, They've moved along the inner and blood resonance. Uh, this solves a long-standing puzzle in galactic dynamics because um, it was first believed that it was a sequence of correlated uh, swing-amplified spirals which would create a ridge which itself would, would trigger the next swing amplification which would create another ridge which would create the next, etc. Whereas what we have shown here is that in the ballet school enough formalism, there's no such correlation. So it can't be uh, a sequence of, of um, self-swing amplified uh, wave creating ridge which explains the formation of the, the final ridge. Uh, it has to be a, a process uh, which um, does not involve this correlation. This is something that uh, Selwood has checked by azimuthally averaging his galaxy after each swing amplification to kill any correlation and he found the same result. Uh, we are predicting that uh, the equation, is, which is a, a 1 over n equation, uh, is driving the process. So we can check by doing many experiments such as Selwood, which is what Jean-Baptiste did here. And we expect uh, uh, two scaling with n if we do a time evolution of the uh, amplitude of the variance of the fluctuation within the disk as a function of time and number of particle. We expect a scaling which grows with time uh, uh, corresponding to the initial Poisson shot noise as 1 over n, and a 1 over n squared for the variance uh, corresponding to the collisional ballet school scaling. And this is what is measured. So you find that there's a good agreement between the fact that it should be 1 over n and 1 over n squared. Uh, if you compute how long it takes for the ridge to, to, uh, to grow, uh, 
you find that uh, once you account for the self-gravity uh, of the system through swing amplification, uh, there's a uh, qualitative agreement for how long it takes in the simulation to grow and what the equation predicts. And that's thanks to the factor of 10,000. If you don't account for self-gravity, you're wrong by a factor of 10,000. So that's reassuring. And uh, you can see that uh, it is indeed the swing amplification uh, of the self-gravity which is responsible for the process because if you remove the, the tightly wind spiral, the, the grand design spiral, which are being uh, grown by swing amplification from the projection of your response, you find that uh, there, is, uh, there is no uh, diffusion. And if you remove the, the, the M matrix, you don't allow for self-gravity you also find no diffusion. So this is one of the virtue of having such a uh, semi-analytic framework. You can switch things on and off, which you can't do in n-body experiment easily. So it's why it's, it's at least complementary uh, uh, if, uh, to n-body experiments. And um, uh, interestingly, uh, if you let the system evolve long enough, and this is what Selwood found, uh, you will find that after a long time, uh, the ridge will uh, have developed uh, uh, will have changed the internal structure of the disk so that it eventually becomes linearly unstable. So the, the, the pr formation process of the galaxy has put it into such an unlikely state that the stellar system will first diffuse so to distort its orbit up to a point when it's distorted its orbit so much that it can realign them and reshuffle angular momentum by forming a strong bar. So this is quite remarkable about the fact that gravitational system uh, have the potency to evolve into a state of a more uh, higher entropy through both secular processes uh, which allow them to drive them into a linear and stable regime. Um, this is uh, what is shown in this plot by um, uh, Selwood. Uh, after a finite number of orbital time, the system goes into an exponentially unstable Vlasov phase and it forms a strong bar. Uh, and um, 50 seconds. Mm. <laughs> uh, well, just a, a couple of words about this. Uh, once you have this ridge, you're in a situation where you have a, a few orbits which have almost the same angular frequency. This was a toy model which was set up by Lyndon Bell in 79, which I solved uh, in the linear stability response and in the thermodynamic limit uh, during my PhD. Which are, so you ask yourself, how does a set of tumbling orbits like this, say identical orbits, spontaneously evolve into a, a bar-like configuration? Well, it depends on how narrow this ridge is. Uh, if you have uh, all, all uh, um, uh, ellipses have roughly the same angular frequency, it means that uh, the shearing in phase space would, will be slow, so you'll induce an instability by winding in phase space, which is the azimuthal analog of uh, genes instability. Uh, uh, which is represented, uh, uh, the solution is represented here. So this was, a, when I gave this talk in Princeton uh, last December, I conjectured that uh, the instability which develops through the formation of this ridge uh, was actually of this type. Uh, so I resurrected this model which had been, which had been uh, proven wrong uh, for galaxies as a whole uh, between uh, uh, Donald's uh, paper and my PhD. He just forgot to tell me. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, but if you actually uh, do a linear response analysis of, of what's happening in the ridge in this toy experiment and you compare to the end body result, you find that there's a good match including in the pattern speed and the growth rate. So I was really happy to see that uh, we can explain uh, in, the, in the sense of linear stability a la Linden Bell 79 uh, exactly what is driving the system into a linear, in, in, linearly unstable regime once it's formed the ridge. So I'm, uh, I need to wrap up. Uh, I, I'm going to flip some slides showing you, uh, you can do this for the thickening of disk as well. So it's just a distortion in the vertical direction and you can explain disk thickening. So this is again an experiment and this is the match of the experiment. And you find that uh, as, as cosmic time goes, the vertical velocity dispersion rises because of the distortion of the orbits induced by uh, 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 um, balescu lenard evolution. And uh, I will flip a few results on the galactic center. Three minutes, two minutes, one, zero. Uh, galactic center is uh, this cluster of stars. There are some papers. We need to understand how black holes are fed. 
Uh, it's exactly the same problem, uh, except that uh, we have the problem of uh, intrinsic degeneracy of the frequencies. So what we need to do is we need to, in the derivation of the equation, we need to phase average uh, the star onto its Keplerian orbit. So we treat uh, the, the, the basic object is not stars anymore, but it's wires. Otherwise, we have a Dirac delta with zero inside it. So once you do that and you use uh, the Delaunay variables, which are the angle action variables of Keplerian system, uh, you have to deal with the fact that you have uh, 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 precession frequencies induced by the fact that uh, you have a black hole, which has relativistic 1pn correction, that's for... <laughs> and you have a massive uh, disk, so uh, the gravitational potential uh, which induces precession of the orbit is the superposition of these two and you get in-plane precession, uh, which is called uh, uh, resonant uh, scalar uh, relaxation and out-of-plane precession, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it's all very well. You get exactly the same equation, except you've got bars everywhere, and bar means integrated over the fast angle of the star along its Keplerian orbit. But otherwise, it's the same equation. So you avoid Dirac of zero through this averaging. And you can explain through this, and this is what I'm where I'm going to end, I guess, uh, the, uh, the presence of a um, uh, so-called Schwarzschild barrier, which is that uh, stars can diffuse towards the black hole, but they tend to stall at some finite radius, which you explain very simply in the context of this equation, because basically we're looking here at the angular frequency as a function of radius. So here we're dominated by the black hole, and here we have the contribution for the disk. So as long as uh, we are looking uh, at a region where the frequency is below this maximum here, things can talk to each other. So a star can talk to another star close to the black hole and allow this star to diffuse inwards. But as soon as I reach a frequency above that threshold, these stars can't talk to anybody anymore. And so the diffusion stalls. And this is uh, shown here in a cartoon. Uh, this is um, uh, slow action and uh, adiabatic fast action. Uh, you see that the stars are, can resonate, can uh, talk to each other up to some uh, finite barrier, which is fixed by this condition of going above the plateau. And this is an experiment uh, of uh, taking the Langevin counterpart of the ballet lenard equation, which is the uh, stochastic formulation of the uh, equivalent Fokker Planck. So you see that uh, as a function of time, the initial distribution of uh, Keplerian orbits as a function of angular momentum diffuses literally. This is a diffusion process, but you get this accumulation of, uh, of um, uh, uh, Keplerian orbits at some finite rate angular momentum cor corresponding to the Schwarzschild barrier. And this is the corresponding uh, result for uh, the implementation of the uh, uh, PDF uh, ballet Coulenard. So this is the stochastic counterpart of this. And this and this. And last slide. Uh, if you take two types of species, uh, you have uh, low mass stars and high mass stars orbiting a galactic center. You find uh, that uh, through diffusion, uh, you have again the Schwarzschild barrier but you will find that you have a mass segregation which is somewhat counterintuitive. You know from globular clusters that if you have two species in a globular cluster, the more massive sink in. In some sense, this is what's happening here in the sense that the lighter stars are going to spend more time in the outskirts, but because they become more eccentric, they also, spend more, they also zip through the center and in the process of being swallowed. So get, you get anti-mass segregation. It's the light stars which get swallowed first by the black hole. So these are my conclusion. Uh, we, we've uh, investigated uh, the secular evolution of self-gravitating systems uh, uh, and first implemented uh, the um, ballet coulenard uh, equation uh, in two uh, new regimes, uh, uh, stellar disk and galactic centers. Uh, ballet coulenard equation is uh, the equa master equation to describe the re resonant relaxation. And... Uh, oh. And uh, I wanted to add one last sentence. Uh, as you saw, a collisionist gravitational system really like to move to more likely states, but are stuck by birth and symmetry into an unlikely states. So very unlikely for disks and somewhat unlikely for, for halos. But given a long time, uh, given time enough, they will find a way of uh, exploring more likely states. Okay, thank you very much.
So, time for questions. Joe? Joe, wait for the microphone, otherwise we won't hear you. It's a beautiful summary, but you, you didn't comment on the dynamic effects of the central black hole. I mean, that um, stars interact with that, and that can also have early feedback effects during explosions or whatever, which can give you dynamical issues with high-velocity high stars. Uh, how can you distinguish those, those effects easily from these more secular effects that you're describing? Which effect do you have in mind? Well, uh, swing shot t times. You know, a binary comes near the central black hole and one star gets ejected at high velocity. That's one example. Another one is early explosions a million years ago, pushing gas clouds around that communicate velocities to, to newly formed stars. All that over time can have an effect on the orbits. I'm just wondering how you could uh, ever distinguish those from these other secular effects. So there's a big, uh, there's a big, um, non-D, I don't know how you say that in English, um, something under the carpet in the context of uh, applying secular evolution in the galactic center is we don't know whether the stellar cluster S1 is a long-term thing or is a transient. So we don't know whether this is climate or weather. I'm assuming here in the context of applying a secular theory that it is not weather. Uh, one thing that one needs to take into account is if this Schwarzschild barrier is really so efficient, then we still uh, have a fine-tuning problem because all the stars are going to stop at some finite distance. But on yet longer time scales, two-body relaxation corresponding to literally stars being deflected à la Chandra Sekar will play a role. Uh, but I guess I'm not answering your question because you're asking for things which are faster rather than things which are longer. Um, I guess I don't have much to say about things which are faster. Um, you mean they would destroy the cluster before? Uh, I was just thinking of just in general perturbations, the velocity field that would tell you something about the history of I do have something to say about events. this. Uh, it's on this slide, isn't it? This is, uh, when I gave this talk um, uh, in Princeton, there was somebody who was working on tidal uh, disruption event. And so uh, my understanding, but I'm really not an expert, is that there's some intermediate radius here, which is not the Schwarzschild radius, where a star can lose its atmosphere by getting close to the, uh, to the black hole. And so people are investigating this in the context, in particular, M31. Uh, I'm thinking of Marianne, somebody. Uh, and so we're, we're trying to investigate how we can uh, transpose our formalism to M31 and, and compute the rate of tidal disruption events of stars getting close to the, uh, to the uh, black hole, but not, uh, not close enough to be stalled. Um, of course, an, a, a thing of interest in the context of uh, gravitational waves is to try and say something about how you can spin up or spin down the black hole. So in principle, this formalism can be translated into a rotating black hole or flattened cluster. Uh, it's obviously more complicated, so Jean-Baptiste is working on the spherical case for now. We've done the disk case. Okay. Thank you very much, Christophe, for this very nice uh, presentation of the resonance and recurrence and so on. Um, I, I am very puzzling. Could you comment about the role of the bulge? Because you don't discuss about it, and at very high rate shift, a priori, the bulge is the main component. Maybe it is an apparent effect, but it so is the main component. So my bulge was hidden, but it's there. Uh, <laughs> where is it? <laughs> Well, let me just tell you. Uh, when I was considering a disk, a mestal disk, in order to be stable, it needs to be cut in the outskirt and cut in the, in the inner region. The inner region is supposed to be um, neutral with respect to swing amplification. That's where the bulge is. So the bulge is not a problem uh, or... Uh, I mean, it's taken care of, if you want, in this. Well, of course, the size of the bulge... I really ought to find this plot. The size of the bulge is going to change this 
going to tell you where the region which is most relevant for south gravity is in action space. So it will change the, the, the angular momentum of the stars which are going to play a role in this process. If you, if you increase, I have actually, uh, we played with this uh, literally. This is, uh, this is what happens in phase space, again, in, um, in action space, depending on whether you change, for instance, the self-gravity of the halo. So here it's, uh, it's a more massive uh, disk, and here it's a less massive disk. So if the disk is not too massive, uh, you could play the same trick by changing the bulge. Then you will find that the ridge tends to develop along the inner Lindblad resonance, whereas if you make the disk more massive, then the maximum uh, uh, response will be along the co-rotation. So yes, there's a direct impact on what the underlying equilibrium is to what, where and how secular, resolution, secular evolution is going to take place. Basically, uh, as far as I am concerned, you give me a distribution function and I tell you the response. The distribution function in encompasses what, what the potential is, what are the different components of the system, etc. So it's, it's very f versatile formalism in that sense. You just need what the orbital structure is. Obviously, you change the system, you change the orbital structure. Yeah. Um, recently, Tar Alexander and Ben Barrow said that the Swarshi barrier doesn't really exist. Yes. Can you comment on the different approaches and why, well, the Swarshi barrier well, exists or not? They don't. They do numerical experiments, and so they can't decompose the problem into the resonant relaxation versus two-body relaxation. And so, what they've done, if they've integrated long enough, so that two-body relaxation can kick in and allow stars to diffuse again. So there's no, co there's no uh, contradiction whatsoever. It's just that uh, we can split problems and we can also write a, a diffusion equation or a Langevin equation which also has two body relaxation and we would, we would find that stars can and indeed do uh, pass through the barrier. That is the last one. So thanks for the great talk. Um, you didn't speak much about the thickening of the disk. So, yes. that, so in your view, the disk will thicken by resonant uh, resonances between the frequencies of different particles that might be far apart. And so what is the time scale for that compared to the expected time scale from, say, uh, subhalos coming in and heating up the disk? Okay, so I, I am not making a strong statement as you want me to do because in this talk I've only talked about uh, nature, which is self-driven mm -hmm. secular evolution. If you want to address the question of whether or not uh, the, uh, it's the environment which dominates or the uh, intrinsic secular evolution which dominates, you need to model both and decide quantitatively. I gave you a formalism which allows to do, you to do that. Then you need to work it out, plug in the numbers and decide. Have you tried to plug in the numbers just for the first case of just the, uh, the secular evolution? Uh, I think in the paper we find that uh, this process is slow, so it's probably not the dominant one. Uh, but, um, but I think it's an open question. People don't know today what is the origin of it. It depends, it depends on subtle things like the, the, the uh, durée de vie birth time of uh, giant molecular clouds which can deflect. Wh what's nice about this formalism is people used to split the problem in three, uh, whether you have spiral waves which do the trick or radial migration or external stuff. In this formalism that I've presented to you, we already have spiral waves and radial migration at the same time, or vertical mi migration if you prefer. They describe self consistently. If you add an extra term corresponding to the focal plump part driven by the fluctuation of the environment, you would have all three together and you'd be able to decide. So I think it's a step forward, but it needs to be worked out. It's, it's immensely more complicated to do a thickened disk than to do a thin disk for technical reasons. One of them being we don't have angle action variables for thickened system. So you can't even, you don't have the equations in which to write the, equa uh, you don't have the variables in which to write the equations, which is a bit of a bummer. So you need to do some approximation, uh, <laughs> like epicyclic, etc., which is what we did. And we stop here. Thank you. Thank you.